Stan Wadey's story is full of contradictions. He was a Cherokee leader who fought for the Confederacy. He was also the last Confederate general to surrender. Wadey's life was shaped by bitter divides, divides between his own people, divides between North and South, divides between loyalty and survival. His letters reveal a man caught in the chaos of war, leading raids, burning down homes, and fighting against both Union troops and rival Cherokee factions. He wasn't looking for glory. For him, it was about holding on, scraping by, and hoping something would be left when the war finally burned itself out. Stan Wadey didn't jump into the Confederate cause without hesitation. The choice to fight alongside the South was anything but simple for him. The Treaty of New Echota had already made him pretty unpopular among his fellow Cherokee. Signing that treaty back in 1835 meant agreeing to the removal of Cherokee from their lands. This led to the Trail of Tears. His signature meant betrayal to some and that division never healed. So when the Civil War broke out, it wasn't just a matter of North versus South. For Wadey, it was another chapter in a long story of torn loyalties and survival. Wadey wasn't swayed by romantic notions of the Confederacy. His decision to align with them was purely practical. He believed they offered the best chance for Cherokee sovereignty. The Union didn't exactly have a track record of keeping promises to Native Americans. We were looking for our best chance, he explained later in his letters, and I believe that our nation's future depended on it. He signed up, but he knew this would lead to bloodshed between his own people. The Cherokee Nation itself split in two. There was the pro-Confederate faction that followed Wadey, and there were those who sided with the Union. A rift was created, a rift that would pit brother against brother. In his letters, the weight of these choices is clear. I have no pleasure in seeing our people divided, he admitted, but pragmatism overshadowed any sentimentality. Leading his troops in the battle meant turning his back on those who saw the Union as their savior. Tahlequah, the Cherokee capital, became a battleground, Wadey's forces swept in, torching homes, burning down John Ross's house, and killing Union-aligned Cherokee they called Pins. His tone in his letters is flat, almost detached, as he describes these acts. We burnt the council house. There was nothing left standing, he wrote. The Cherokee's own internal war had begun. Pea Ridge was a moment that showed Wadey's resolve to see the Confederacy's cause through, even as things fell apart around him. The fighting was brutal, the stakes enormous. The Union had the upper hand in Arkansas, and Wadey was tasked with leading his Cherokee mounted rifles into the fray. These were not polished soldiers from the East. They were Cherokee warriors, accustomed to guerrilla tactics, not traditional battlefield formations. Yet, at Pea Ridge, Wadey and his men found themselves in the thick of one of the Civil War's larger engagements west of the Mississippi. The battle unfolded chaotically. Confederate forces under General Benjamin McCullough, to whom Wadey reported, launched a desperate attempt to break through Union lines. Wadey's unit was tasked with capturing a Union artillery position, a dangerous, almost suicidal mission. But they went in anyway. The ground trembled as cannons fired and smoke filled the air. Wadey and his men charged forward, managing to capture the guns in a brief but intense fight. We took the cannons, he wrote later. For a moment, the field was ours, but any feeling of victory was fleeting. P. Ridge quickly turned into a disaster. General McCullough was killed and the Confederate forces began to fall apart. Wadey's men, isolated and outnumbered, had no choice but to retreat. The battle was a loss, and worse than that, it was demoralizing. Many of Wadey's Cherokee, especially those who had followed Colonel John Drew, another Cherokee leader, deserted to the Union side. Wadey didn't have the luxury of feeling betrayal. He kept moving forward, as he always did, but Pea Ridge was a reminder that the Confederate cause was slipping further out of reach. Still, Wadey refused to give up, even as his own people turned away from him. Wadey's guerrilla tactics became legendary in the Western theater of the Civil War. If a conventional battle seemed out of reach, he turned to ambushes and raids. One of the craziest came in the summer of 1864. His forces ambushed a Union steamboat J.R. Williams on the Arkansas River. Wadey and his men had been scouting the river for days, watching for an opportunity. When they spotted the J.R. Williams, loaded with supplies bound for Fort Gibson, they knew it was their moment. The attack came suddenly. Wadey's men, hidden along the riverbanks, opened fire as the steamboat chugged along, completely unaware of the ambush waiting for them. Chaos erupted on board, bullets tore through the ship, and Union soldiers scrambled to return fire. But it was too late. Wadey's men swarmed the boat, seizing the valuable supplies. 
The capture of the J.R. Williams wasn't just a military victory, it was a lifeline. The Confederates in the Indian Territory were starving for supplies, and this raid brought in everything from food to medical supplies. The river belonged to us that day, Wadey wrote later. We took what we needed. But it wasn't only supplies that Wadey's men claimed. During the ambush, they slaughtered black Union soldiers and freedmen working as hay cutters. Union reports described it bluntly. Wadey's Indian cavalry killed all the Negroes they could find. Wadey, in his letters, never directly addressed this massacre. He had always been pragmatic, and this raid was no different. Brutal, swift, and merciless. His forces were more than just a thorn in the Union side. They were a nightmare, striking hard and disappearing before the Union could even react. The steamboat ambush cemented Wadey's reputation as a Confederate leader who thrived in the chaos of guerrilla warfare. September 1864 saw Stan Wadey's forces at the peak of their guerrilla success. The Second Battle of Cabin Creek was Wadey's masterpiece, a raid that combined timing, strategy, and sheer nerve. Wadey wasn't working alone on this one. He teamed up with General Richard Gano to pull off one of the most successful Confederate raids in the Western Theater. Their target was a Union supply train hauling a massive amount of goods. What the Confederates lacked in manpower, they made up for in mobility, speed, and the element of surprise. The raid unfolded at night. Wadey and Gano's forces waited for the Union convoy to reach a vulnerable stretch of road. The sound of creaking wagon wheels and the low murmur of Union troops didn't alert them to the Confederate ambush that was about to happen. The attack was sudden. It was brutal. It was effective. Wadey's men stormed the wagons. Within hours, they'd captured the entire supply train, and there was a lot of loot, over a million dollars worth of goods. There was food, clothing, and ammunition too. It was a huge boost to the Confederates in Indian Territory. They'd been living off scraps for months, and now they had the supplies to keep fighting. Wadey was proud of what his men had accomplished. We took the whole train, and for a moment we thought we had turned the tide, he wrote to his wife. But it wasn't just the supplies that boosted morale. It was the sheer audacity of the raid. The Union had thought their supply lines were safe, but Wadey proved otherwise. This wasn't the kind of war fought with honor and clear lines. It was savage. It was opportunistic and raw. The Second Battle of Cabin Creek was a Confederate success story, but Wadey knew victories like this were becoming rarer as the war dragged on. Even in triumph, there was a sense of looming defeat. By early 1865, Stan Wadey was still in the fight, but the world around him was falling apart. The Confederacy had all but collapsed, Lee had surrendered, and the big players were out of the game. Yet Wadey kept going. His forces were a shadow of what they had been, starving, sick, and barely holding it together in Indian territory, far from the crumbling Confederate heartland. But Wadey was not ready to stop. Even as his men fought off hunger more than Union soldiers, they kept moving. They had nothing, but stopping wasn't an option. Wadey led his troops on scattered raids, hitting supply lines, making the most of whatever they could find. It wasn't much, but it was something. The war was already over for most of the South, but in Wadey's world, the fight wasn't over until someone physically stopped him. We've endured everything, he wrote, and it wasn't an exaggeration. His men were out there, digging through scraps, marching through exhaustion, and still willing to follow Wadey to whatever end waited for them. That end came on June 23, 1865 at Dokesville in the Choctaw Nation. There, Wadey signed the ceasefire, becoming the last Confederate general to surrender. He'd held out longer than anyone, months after the war had officially ended. But even in surrender, there was no sense of defeat in his words. I surrender, but I do not yield, he wrote. Wadey had given up the fight, but to him it wasn't a loss, it was survival. He'd fought for the Confederacy, but in his mind it was about securing a future for his people, even as that future slipped further out of reach. In the end, Wadey didn't lose, not in the way others did. He survived. The war was over, but the damage it had done to his people and to himself wasn't going away anytime soon. Thanks for watching Nutty Productions. What other Native American stories do you want to learn about? Let us know in the comments and don't forget to like, subscribe, ring the bell, share this video with a friend and all that good stuff to stay up to date on all the nutty stories from humanity's past.